I work in the Accessibility Services Office, closely related to the Academic Center for Excellence, where you can find tutors, um, you can find academic coaching, and library resources, anything that you need to help you become a better successful student. Um, I think what we should do first is talk about the important differences between high school and college. And um, just to touch base a little bit about that, um, in high school, a lot of students are used to um, hearing the word special education. In college, um, you might hear a couple of different terms. It falls under the um, disability services category. Uh, the new trend now is accessibility services. So the person that you'd wanna connect with um, prior to starting courses at an, um, any college would be to meet with your accessibility services coordinator or specialist. And um, we'll talk about more about handing in paperwork and what's required. Uh, but just to give you um, the background information, um, the colleges do um, fall under the category with, uh, for the American with Disabilities Act, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Um, in high school, you might hear the words 504 plans or IEPs, Individual Education Plans, I believe that's called. Um, <clears throat> but in colleges, you're going to hear terms like um, letters of accommodation, reasonable accommodation plans, um, also known as LOAs or RAPs. Um, the, um, in high school, when you're working with um, counselors and um, case managers, uh, you know that the services are provided by the high school. And once you get into colleges, um, that changes a little bit. It, is, it becomes a student's and the family's responsibility to touch base with accessibility services to let, let us know. Um, because all we get from you when you apply to a college is your transcripts of high school, but nothing um, personalized. So we don't have any information on any disabilities or um, what kind of um, programs you were working with prior to entering college. Um, so first and foremost, the student is responsible, along with family, if necessary, to request any kind of accommodations. Um, if I was to pick what is um, what you, you might recognize as our letters of accommodation to be, would be similar to that of a 504 plan. Um, so there are some um, qualifications of um, who can be covered by such accommodation plans, and we'll get into that a little bit further. Um, the important thing to know in, in high school, curriculum can be modified. That is a different story when it comes to college. Students need to meet all course objectives and there is no course modifications. Um, the student must meet the minimum requirements of what all the other students in the class are doing, um, but that's when the accommodations come to, into place. So if there's a barrier that's preventing you from being successful, then um, we can discuss these things um, together to create something that would work for you. Um, for example, uh, everybody does test in college. Um, you might have a need to have some extra time or maybe a distraction-free room. That's just one example of um, how we can modify changes to the classroom. Um, in high school, the specialist informed the teacher that the student need, uh, of the student's need through an IEP. Um, here in college, the students are, resp are responsible for informing their professors of, to inform them of their needs. You can do that through um, email or bring the actual accommodation letter to the professor. Um, once you have received an accommodation letter, um, that professor does not hear from our our office, they do, certainly wouldn't hear from me because um, we are protected by the FERPA policy. Um, it's a privacy act for schools. And um, it is the responsibility of the students to relay that information to the professors. Um, letters of accommodations are not set in stone. They can be updated. They can be changed throughout the year. Let's say um, something is just not right and uh, you're looking to 
um, change an accommodation that you think otherwise might be more helpful, um, we can do that. Every letter of accommodation is dated at the bottom, so we can do an update. Um, but also, it's important to keep in contact with your instructors so that they are in the loop. They understand things happen. They know about emergencies. They know about students who may not have a disability or any special needs. However, um, this would also cover um, students that were in car accidents, students that were injured playing sports. All of those things are covered under the ADA. Um, but again, it's the responsibility of the student to share their information with the instructors. Um, basically, and the bottom line is you do not have to disclose your personal information. Um, but if you would like to do so, that, that's okay. But it just doesn't come from our office. Um, but to qualify well, for I the just letter. Can I ask a quick question about that, Joanna? Sure. Um, the letter of accommodation that you talked about, that letter is going to include all, it's going to list all of the accommodations. Is that right? That's, yes, that's included in that letter and not yes. anybody's diagnosis or anything like that. It's just what somebody needs for supports to move forward. That's correct. Okay, thanks. Um, the other thing just to touch base about a little bit is when you're in high school, sometimes testing is provided to you. Um, these, the, the example that I like to use is the um, is neuropsychological exams. Um, a lot of students have testing that is provided so that they can come up with a plan um, to support an IEP. Um, in college, unfortunately, we do not have the ability or um, the resources to do testing here on site. Um, how and so, however, it, we would be able to refer out, and we know about this the places that would be able to accommodate such testing should that need arise. Um, when you arrive um, into college and you're going to um, approach a, an accessibility services person, you can always um, use any um, formal testing that was done that's within the three to five year range. So when it comes to applying for accessibility services, um, we would take that kind of documentation. That documentation um, could include the use, you know, the IEP that you had in the 504 plan. However, the IEP and 504 plan doesn't really stand alone. It's great information to have. Um, a lot of times the answers that we're looking for are in there, however, um, just a, a little extra support is sometimes needed for the college level. Um, and we also I just want to add um, for families listening that we often encourage families who have those tests available to them in high school to um, try and schedule those for the within the last two years of high school so that they're timely when they when they do go to college. Thanks, Joanna. Thank you. Um, so. At the end of the day, when you're um, in high school and um, the student's strengths and challenges are determined by the specialist, in college here, the students are expected to develop their self-advocacy skills. Um, students will be evaluated by course objectives that are held to all student standards here. And, um, Students were, will be given the equal opportunity to pursue programs, um, but if it just means that they need a little help in removing barriers that are preventing them from being successful in class, then that's what we're here to support. Um, so that's the background with the differences between um, high school and college. And then as far as getting involved with accessibility services, it's a very simple process. Um, I, I use the three steps um, from college to college. This might differ. Um, I'm working with Concord um, Community College here at NHTI. So what we're looking for when we meet new families is um, the first to contact the accessibility services office. So at that point, there will be an application and um, the application will tell us a little bit about yourself. It will um, highlight what areas there may be some struggles in, 
And also there's a spot to say you have used accommodations in the past. So if something was working for you in high school, that's the place to put, jot down what was working for you, what you think could help. And um, so we take it from there. Um, the other piece of the application is I was talking about privacy and how I don't share um, any personal information with faculty or coaches, academic advisors. Um, that policy that you are just, that you should be signing would be um, the confidentiality piece where if you put down that I am able to talk to a parent or if I am able to talk to you know, a, a not, somebody that can act on your behalf or wanna ask questions to make sure we've covered all bases, that is absolutely wonderful. And I encourage you to do that. Um, so that way there we have it in our files. And so if I receive a phone call, it just takes minutes to make sure that that person is someone that you want in your um, ballpark and that it's okay to talk to that person. I highly recommend when you're doing the privacy form that you do involve um, your academic advisor, um, possibly your department head of what, whichever program you chose. And that way there we can have an open, transparent communication between all of us. Because if should you ever need me to act for your behalf, I would be glad to do so as long as I have the permission. Um, one piece of the application process, which would be um, step two, is to obtain the proper documentation. We talked about IEPs and 504 plans and any kind of specialized testing reports. Um, those things are all welcome and very handy. If by chance you do not have any of that information, don't worry because on the last two pages of the application piece will be what we call a disability verification form. And that can be um, given to anybody that you work with. So it could be if you were working with an outside agency or if you're, you have a counselor, if you have a therapist, a medical doctor, specialist, anybody that has those special letters after their name, that's you know PhD, MD, um, any of those, um, we can take that information. And basically what the documentation piece does is confirms what you said on your application um, and then gives us more ideas of, how, of what could be helpful and beneficial for you when it comes to accommodations. So then the question becomes, so then that's it. Once those two um, things are handed in, documentation application, the third step is a meeting with your accessibility services person, um, at whichever college that you choose. And usually that's when the accommodation letter is developed. And then um, you'll, you can see it in different forms. Um, most colleges use the, the bullet point system just to make it clear and concise. Um, so things on the accommodation letter may um, have things like preferential seating, um, extra time on tests, um, leaving the classroom should you have to um, take some medication or you just you can't sit for that very that long of a time you just need to stretch there's an ex, you know there, you can be excused from class to come and, and then sit back in so they do get very specific to each individual because we have a wide range of students with various disabilities and um, that's that's the end of your letter the question now is who is eligible for services? And um, when I was looking at the steps to accessing accessibility services, um, anybody that falls under these um, categories, um, a student who is taking at least one course and who has a diagnosed disability with the documentation, a history of disability but, not, but has not previously received services, so just because you didn't have services in high school doesn't mean that you're counted out. And a history of school difficulties who may have been undiagnosed, who may have an undiagnosed learning disability or attention deficit order or other disability. So again, um, accessibility needs comes in a wide range of services. Um, some people may look like they don't have a disability, but they do. Um, last night during the live meeting, we used the example of if you see a person walking with a cane or a dog, like you know that person has a challenge. 
uh, most likely with that being um, blind or um, not the best sight. And so um, just know that there are people all around you that you wouldn't even know. And it is a very confidential matter. We just um, keep it to our office, but we do support these students. We always encourage the use of the resources around us, which is why we're all located in one area. So um, if you are struggling in any academic way, always keep a note with your advisor, with your advisor, your instructor, most importantly, um, because if we don't know that you're struggling, we can't help. So I encourage you to keep in contact with instructors, come visit us, tell us, your, tell us what you're struggling with. Maybe it's just you need a little extra help in math. We have a math lab, open hours, you, gotta, you have to come in and advocate for yourself and we're here to support you.